Welcome, Adam Sud, to the face of the deep. You, it's your initiation. So uh... yeah, this is this is going to be a fun one. I'm I'm like like I mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, I've been a fan of yours for a long time. I've known uh, I've known about you for several years now, and and I've 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 wanted to have conversations with you, and and so I'm very excited to do this with you today. Oh, uh, well, same. Likewise. I mean, I think you and I have traveled such a parallel path, um, even down to some of the timing, like your your sobriety journey starting in 2012, mine in 2013, wow. um, both, yeah. both of us going, going down to the depths of uh, like redefining rock bottom <laughs> yeah. um, in our, in our own ways. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously sort of divergent in other ways, but I think we, we have come around to sort of thinking of addiction and dependency and sobriety and recovery and all of these sort of catchphrases in a different way than uh, you're going to find in a lot of the plant-based world and sure. just just in general. So so yeah, I, I think this is a much needed conversation and I'm, I'm super looking forward to it. So I agree. yeah, yeah. Well, let's jump in. I don't know that everyone uh, listening knows your story. So do you, you want to give us um, kind of a run through on how you yeah. got to where you are and, and you know, where you've come from, because it's a pretty compelling account. I, I would love to. Uh, so first of all, to the people who are listening, uh, my name is Adam Sud. Um, I, I, I'm a nutrition and behavior change enthusiast. Uh, I don't like to say expert because I don't really know how you would define that, but I, I'm very enthusiastic about understanding those two things. And certainly uh, the, 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 uh, the science of addiction and the physiology of addiction and the psychology of addiction, and in my opinion, why it makes so much sense. Um, and this was not where my life started. I was born in, in Texas in 1982. I'm a sixth or seventh generation Houstonian. And I grew up on burgers and barbecue and bagels and blintzes because I'm, I'm also Jewish. So I had um, what, I, what I call the standard American diet wearing cowboy boots with chutzpah. Like that's, <laughs> that was what was on my plate every single day. And to be fair, look, I had a phenomenal uh, childhood. Uh, my dad taught me how to play every sport under the sun. My mom inspired my imagination. I'm, I'm an identical twin. So I was born with a best friend. And then I got a younger sister several years later. So I, I got another best friend. And I had all my all my school friends lived in my neighborhood. I used to ride my bike to and from school every single day. Um, but something happened about the time I turned 10 years old. Um, by the time I was about 10 years old, I can remember this one situation where I came, it was summer in Texas, I come running into the house in my bathing suit. And my parents, they stopped me and they, they, they were so concerned. And there was so much upset on their face. And they asked me to tell them why I already had love handles. And, you know, I'm 10 years old, I don't know what that term means at that age. Mm. I can, I'm aware that they're they're not okay with this whatever it is and they explain it to me and what i what i noticed now looking back was that up until that moment i lived in full acceptance of myself both physically and emotionally i had a relationship with myself physically and emotionally that i was excited to show up and be present for every single day and as a result of that in that that situation in that moment I started to believe that there were conditions upon which I was allowed to accept myself fully and completely. And that if there's one situation, are there others? And why do I not know what they are? And how am I going to find out what they are? Mm -hmm. So I started to have all this kind of emerging anxiety because now tomorrow didn't feel like such a safe place anymore. The present moment was far less safe, secure, and hopeful. Tomorrow was even less safe, secure, and hopeful because I was always worried now, when am I going to find out who else doesn't want, want me around? And I started to be a very hypervigilant person, a very anxious person. I was always aware of how people were responding to me. I was very sensitive to their, to their facial expressions, to their, their behavior cues as a way of finding out... I hope I'm not upsetting you. I don't want to be, I don't want to be seen as a broken, messed up person. And so I started to act out in school as one does to try to distract people from looking at me, look at my behavior. Just, oh, I'm the class clown, oh, I'm this. And so I was taken to a doctor and I was prescribed Ritalin for ADHD. It was about age 12. And so now this is another situation where I had a person of authority 
someone who I was taken to by my parents to find out if something was wrong and what it was. And this person of authority effectively said, well, we found something else. We found out something that you, you don't want, the world doesn't want, your parents don't want, and it's called ADHD and don't worry about it. We're going to, we're going to solve this really easily. What we're going to do is we're going to put you on a medicine called Ritalin. And what this is going to do is it's going to effectively hide what is not okay about you from the world. So just do that thing and hopefully you will be tolerable. That's not what the doctor said, but that's the, that's what I, that's what I brought in as, as what was taking place. And so I, I think from that point on, I, I saw that there was a solution to not being okay. And that is to find something outside of myself that could mask what was occurring so that I could feel okay. And we moved to Austin, Texas, right before I started high school. This was like 1997. And uh, I didn't, I was going to start high school without knowing anybody. And the, the advocacy around bullying then didn't exist. And I experienced in my first year of high school, the worst bullying I've ever experienced in my life. Uh, physical bullying, uh, psychological bullying, uh, verbal bullying. Uh, in fact, it was so bad that about halfway through my high school year, when I got dropped off at school, the assistant principals had to get their eyes on me to make sure that I made it into the school safely. And so I want to explain to everybody what was going on. Because from the point when my parents first started criticizing me about my body, that kept going. I would hear them make comments to me about what I was eating, why I was, was I eating it? Do you want to do that? Are you sure you want to look like this? While at the same time, having a dad who would come in from running eight to 10 miles a day, looking like Captain America, and then hearing him criticize his own body and criticize his own self, which created a sense of like, oh my gosh, if that's not worthy of applause, what chance do I have? My parents must think I'm disgusting and I should think I'm disgusting. So I had an experience where I would wake up into the presence of, of parents who were phenomenal loving parents, but didn't always feel like a safe, secure, and hopeful place to be. Mm -hmm. I would wake up into a body that didn't feel like a safe, secure, and hopeful place to be. I would go to school where physically and emotionally did not feel like a safe, secure, and hopeful place to be. And there was always a sense that tomorrow could be worse. Now that is a breeding ground for the very appropriate response, which is depression and anxiety. I didn't have anything that I, I had very few things that I felt that were going on in my life that I wanted to show up and be present for. And tomorrow was not something I was certainly looking forward to being a part of. So depressed about not having a life or having a life that wasn't going as it should and having a future that I didn't know if I wanted to be a part of. And I can remember in the middle of class one day, I come, I, I would take, I, I'd take two doses of Adderall per day. My prescription from Ritalin was changed to Adderall at this time. And Adderall, for those who don't know, it's just, it's an amphetamine based medication used to treat ADHD. I'm not saying I'm anti Adderall. I'm just trying to be accurate about what it is. And I take it in the middle of the class and I walk out of the classroom. And one of the guys who would regularly bully me, he grabs me around the neck, but this is different. It's not the typical, I'm going to harm you grab. It's more of like a, Hey buddy, come over here kind of thing. He says, hey, listen, Adam, you know, you're the new kid. It's you're a freshman. You know, you understand we had to haze you, right? I want you to know that's all over with. No one's going to do that anymore. In fact, we want you to come to a party this weekend and uh, just bring your Adderall with you. Now, look, I may have been an awkward freshman. That is not up for debate. That is 100% true. I was an awkward kind of uh, uh, insecure, um, uh, unpopular kid, but I wasn't stupid. And I was very aware of what was taking place. And I'm going to tell you, I felt relieved because what I, I had just been presented with was the opportunity to feel slightly more safe in a life that didn't feel very safe. Oh, seems like if I am this person for them, I don't get harmed anymore. How attractive that feeling of being able to zero in on what someone else wants from me and, yeah. and knowing how to give it to them like that it, to, to be in the nervous system that you're describing as a kid growing up in that, with that set of forces, like that is an exhilarating feeling. Like I have what they want and, and I, I can, have what they want. I can and make it might, this happen. 
I have what they want and it looks like it might stop them from causing me physical harm. Yeah. How, how attractive is that? That's, yeah. I mean, my, my psychology and my motivational system should be very compelled to do what they want to do. And it's, that's exactly what happened. And I'm going to tell you, I went to the party, I brought my Adderall with me. I gave it to everybody that, that wanted it. And I used it for the first time as a recreational drug, which I actually, I, I didn't know you, that you could do that. And I'm going to tell you what took place that night. It was like, boom, um. with unbelievable ease and unbelievable repeatability, I seem to have figured out how to solve a life that didn't feel like a place I wanted to be a part of. So Adderall is amphetamine. I mentioned that before. And so what that does is that gives you an incredible sense of, uh, of confidence. Mm -hmm. uh, I had unbelievable energy. I felt very confident. Um, I was now for the first time able to go up to people and start talking to them. And whatever they were talking about was, was already interesting to me. I didn't have to fake it. It seemed to make me a person that was a social person. I could make friends. I could do the things. Also, being the person that brought it, everyone was glad that I was there. That's new for me. How mm. fantastic. I, I, I now have, I, I can now be a confident person. I can now be someone people want around. I don't get harmed anymore. Adderall is an amphetamine and, and I was an overweight freshman. I seem to notice if I keep taking Adderall, I don't want to eat. I have unbelievable amounts of energy. I can go 110% at a party for 24 hours. And I also noticed that I could occupy the behaviors that look like a uh, an effective student. Seemed like for the first time, I looked like someone who liked to study, which made my dad start to, to view me in a different light. So what I want people to understand is this. If you were me and your life looked like mine and your life felt like mine and you were to use, what you would notice is that that use looks and feels almost exactly like self-care. Exactly. And yeah. in my opinion, what addiction is, is misguided self-care. Mm -hmm. That's what I think is taking place. It's that you are somehow being fooled into believing that you've solved problems in your life that make your life not a place you want to be a part of, while also releasing neurochemicals that give you a sense that somehow tomorrow is safe. You're going to be fine. You've statistically increased your likelihood of survival. Good for you. Mm -hmm. And so every instinct in you should be attracted to that behavior, especially if your life hurts, especially if there's nothing meaningful in your life that gives you the sense that you can do that on your own. You should be attracted to it. And I'm going to tell you, I created what I like to call a loving and meaningful bond with the behavior of using. Mm. Because using did for me what nothing has been able to do for me for things that were the most difficult things in my life. And so for me, it became an unbelievably important and meaningful behavior to continue doing. And it worked. Oh my gosh, did it work. I lost weight. I made friends. I did really, really well in the school, in the parts of school that I really liked, because I do have ADHD and uh, well, I have attention issues. Um, and uh, I got a scholarship to the college that I wanted to go to. I had girlfriends. I mean, it was, it was amazing. It seemed to make my life the life I thought life was supposed to feel like. And right. until it didn't anymore. And that was about the time I got into college and everything went to the total trajectory of the drug addiction story, which is more becomes never enough, not enough becomes everyday problem. How am I going to get more? How much is it going to cost? Where am I going to get that? And to the point where I ended up having, I dropped out of college. I came back to Austin. I started to engage in criminal drug activity where I was prescribed. I was forging prescriptions. I was doctor shopping. I was dealing and, and buying and selling drugs on the street. I was stealing from people. I was stealing from my family. I was becoming incredibly isolated. Um, I was, uh, the only time I would ever see my parents was to either blame them or shame them for the things that weren't working in my life or to ask them for money. Um, I started to engage in a secondary addictive behavior around fast food because I was using so much Adderall that within two weeks, I wouldn't have any. And I have to go another two weeks so I could get more. And so I found fast food was an amazing way to just get myself to feel very numb for about two weeks. And then once I can get more, uh, then I would start using the, the Adderall again. And to put it into perspective, I was eating about 5,000 calories of fast food a day for two weeks straight. 
Then I would get a hold of Adderall and the average prescription for Adderall is, Adderall is about 10 milligrams for every 24 hours. I was doing a minimum of 450 milligrams of Adderall in a 24 hour period, sometimes up to a thousand. And I would do that for six days straight without stopping. Man. Um, at that point, I would have to uh, start taking high doses of opiates in order to get myself to come, to come down. down and go to sleep. Yeah. And then I would just wake up and start that cycle all over again. And I'm going to tell you every, every aspect of my life hurt. I had no, no loving and meaningful bonds that I could show up and be present with because they had been completely severed by this belief that Adderall was a solution. Mm -hmm. I had been fooled into believing that Adderall was a solution to getting the life you want when in fact it was separating me from the loving and meaningful bonds that give me the experience of being meaningfully alive. My family, I didn't feel like I had a right to be present with them. A loving and meaningful bond with myself both physically and emotionally that I want to show up and be present for was severed. A loving and meaningful bond with a purpose beyond myself that I could share within a community of shared respect was completely severed. A loving and meaningful bond with the natural world was completely severed. And mostly important, I think, is a, a loving and meaningful bond with a future that makes sense. That was completely severed. Not only did my future not make sense, my future for the first time in my life had become a place that I so desperately didn't want to be a part of. Dread it. What yeah. I want people to understand when we talk about this is when we look at this person, if you were to look at me and you were to tell the story of addiction that most people hear, Adderall, uh, addiction is about the chemical hooks in the substance. And that's what it is. And if you do it enough times, you're going to get hooked and you can't not use anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you that story is flawed. If you were to look at my experience or anybody who's struggling with substance use, what you're going to see is that their substance use is an appropriate adaptation to a life that doesn't feel like it makes sense anymore whatsoever. Someone could look at that person and go, how can that person keep using? They must be crazy. Because for that person, being present in their life is a safe and secure and hopeful thing to do. So to be severed from it through use makes no sense. And they'll also say, why would they do this? Don't they know what's going to happen in 10 years? That's crazy. Well, of course, for that person who's observing, that's crazy because 10 years from now, it feels like a safe, secure, and hopeful place to be. It's something that they actively want to get to. For that person who's using, today is painful and tomorrow is somewhere they don't want to be. They don't mind being numbed. They don't mind being disconnected from their daily life. And they don't mind compromising their future because their future isn't somewhere they want to be a part of at all. I got to the point where life became the hardest experience I'd ever had. Uh, I was about two weeks away from being homeless. I weighed nearly 350 pounds. I had undiagnosed chronic diseases. Um, and you know, I, I'll say it like this, living just hurt. It hurt in every sense of the word, physically, spiritually, emotionally. And every single day that I was alive was the most painful day of my life while having full confidence that tomorrow was going to be much worse. And event, you know, you live that in that mindset long enough, tomorrow becomes something you just cannot be a part of. And so on August 21st of 2012, uh, I tried to end my life by suicide. Um, now, I didn't write a note. Um, I, you know, it wasn't really anything that I had, I, of course, I had been thinking about it for probably six months, but it wasn't something like, okay, today's the day kind of thing. But, you know, I was 30 years old. I already had erectile dysfunction for reasons I didn't understand. I had infected scratches on my legs that wouldn't heal for reasons I didn't understand. Like I mentioned, I was, I was broke. I was two weeks away from being homeless. And people would say, at this point, why would you not call your family? Why would you not do that? And I think it comes back to the belief that it's very difficult to have lingering threads of connection and potentially threaten that last lingering thread of connection by showing someone wow. who you truly are. Man, that is so important. We'll come back to that. That's Oh huge. my gosh, if I was to tell you exactly who I am, you might not want me anymore. And I don't know if I can hear that. I might rather spare myself and them the burden of knowing me and yeah. just end it. Oh my God. That's so, yeah, that is, I haven't heard you or anyone else articulate it in just that way before, but that is, 
That is so true. That's why you don't just get help. You just right. don't reach exactly. out. You, you're, you're, try, you're, you're holding yourself above water. So that you're, you're working so hard to just maintain yeah. that level and that overwhelming fear of losing the last tenuous little connection that you have. If um, that's gone, why even stay here? Then you're annihilated. You're, yeah. you're, you're gone. You're so, gone. And yeah. so I intentionally overdosed and, um, you know, I'd had overdoses before, uh, I'd been struggling with substance use disorder at that time for 10 years, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, I can remember this being distinctly different. Uh, I grabbed a handful of pills. I swallowed them all. Um, and I, I remember starting to feel very, uh, a very interesting feeling. I was sitting on my couch and I lived like a hoarder. So my entire apartment was just covered in garbage. And I tried to stand up. I had this funny feeling like I was going to throw up. That's what it felt like. And I was like, all right, let me just stand up. And as soon as I did, it felt like I got stabbed in the right side with a hot knife. My entire right side of my body cramped. Mm. And I buckled forward and my vision starts to go black very fast. And um, I'm going to tell you that the feeling that I had in that moment, and I'm not talking about the physical description that I just laid out. I, I'm, I'm talking about the feeling that I had of... I don't know what it feels like to die, but I do know what it feels like to believe that you're dying of a life filled with regret. Mm. And that is, that is the most painful place I've ever been in my life. Um, rock bottom is a beautiful place. And I say it like that because it is, you will be presented front and center with the reality that if you don't go this way instead of that way now, yeah, you don't get any more of life. Change and if your not, if you don't just, it's not that you lose the bad parts, you lose all of it. Yeah. You lose everything that you still have any lingering love for, and you lose any potential in the future that you're not aware of. And that is a very terrifying place to be because I don't know if we get around to, I don't know if we get back, come, get to come back. I don't know if I believe in anything like that. But what I'm very certain of is that we all get to exist as the individuals that we are once. And I saw that being taken from me mm -hmm. and I saw that being taken, not because other people wanted it but because I made it impossible for other people to stop it from happening. I woke up on the floor of my apartment in a puddle of my own vomit, in a pile of fast food garbage, surrounded by empty pill bottles. And I was overwhelmed with immense relief. It took me about an hour, I, I believe, to kind of realize where I was, what had just taken place. And I felt very, I felt confused by that relief. I really did because I thought what suicide is, is someone deciding to end their life. But that relief, and if you ask anyone who's a survivor, they'll tell you, first thing they feel is regret, the second thing they feel is relief. Yeah. Both of those things are only possible if there's something about your life that you love enough. That there's something about myself and my life that was meaningful enough that even though today would likely be the most painful day I'd ever had, I was relieved to still be here. And so I decided I would pick up the phone and, and make that very terrifying call to my family and ask for help. And, and that's exactly what I did. And as a result, they helped me check into a rehab facility where um, I can remember checking into rehab. That was a very, very, very scary thing. And, and I'll tell everyone here, you know, I, my life was so undoable uh, that I had to use before I, I left to go to over of my course. Everyone does. I think everyone does right before rehab. That's because everyone's in that place. Yeah. Everyone's life is undoable. It's Can't do yeah. it. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was really scared. Um, I, I didn't know if I could do this thing called sobriety or recovery or however you want to phrase it. I didn't know if I would want to do it. And I didn't know if my life would be something I wanted to be a part of without drugs. And then what's my life. Yeah. And I remember I got called into the doctor's office. The first two, three days of rehab were a bunch of psychological and, and emotional evaluations and physical uh, biometric testing. And they strip search you, they search your bags, and it's a very dehumanizing experience. And I come into the doctor's office and they tell me that I have uh, very advanced type 2 diabetes, 
very high blood pressure. In fact, my blood pressure was like 210 over 130. My resting heart rate was like 115. My fasting blood glucose was 400. My oh cholesterol my was over 300. They diagnosed me with clinical depression, uh, anxiety disorder, sleep disorder, attention deficit disorder, obsessive compulsive personality disorder. And they put me on like 15 medications. And they're telling me, you know, Adam, because of your weight, because of your diabetes, you know, there's a very high likelihood that you can have a heart attack in the near future. Um, none of these things are reversible. You're going to have them for life. That, uh, and you know, you're 30, you're 30, 30 years old at this point. And they're like, you know, you, there's a real risk that you're going to lose your sight, your vision, you could lose limbs. This is, this is your reality. But Adam, if you want your life to get better, you have to stop using drugs. And I thought to myself, what a terrible solution. Mm -hmm. You just, this is the doctor I'm talking to. You just laid out a future that I have no interest in being a part of. Yeah. As if it's certainty. What, what urgency do I have now to care if I ever stop using? If that's where I'm headed, why should I care about changing anything? And I don't know, I didn't have any authority to, to kind of question what recovery is then, but I certainly didn't like the idea that he was suggesting that the solution is to stop using. I came to the conclusion that what I wanted to do was reverse engineer aliveness. I wanted to be the architect of a life that felt like such a safe, secure, and hopeful place to be that use would be no longer necessary. I wanted the way that I reorganized my environment, my priorities and values to create an experience of being present in a life that didn't require use. If I could do that, then perhaps my future trajectory changes. Perhaps I don't lose limbs. Perhaps I don't have a heart attack. Perhaps I don't have all these things. And, and I had the good fortune of, of before checking into to, to treatment about a year before that, I, I got dragged to a presentation by a guy named Rip Esselstyn, <laughs> right? Where I, where I heard about this. And here's the thing. I didn't know who he was. I didn't want to know who he was. I'd never heard of a plant-based diet. I sure as shit didn't want to know what a plant-based diet was. But all I kept thinking to myself was, I don't know anything about mental health. I don't know anything about addiction or depression, anxiety. But one thing I was very good at was putting food on my plate. What if I just simply did that thing that that guy, Rip Esselstyn, said? What if I could sort of use that as a way to start to create a sense that my life could look different in six months. Mm -hmm. And I got out of rehab because they weren't going to let me change my diet. And I moved into a sober living facility and I walked up to the house manager whose last name is actually hamburger. And I told him, Hey, listen, I want to eat a plant-based diet. Here's what I need. And it was like a list of like five or six foods. It was oatmeal, rice, beans, frozen vegetables, and fruit. That's it. Because before that, the only greens I ate were the piece of lettuce. They didn't take off my burger at McDonald's. And I got the next morning and I can tell you, I was a very inspired person. I was, was inspired to do this thing. I really was. And I go and I open the pantry and there was the oatmeal that they got me and they put it right next to a box of Fruity Pebbles, which is the best cereal of all time. <laughs> this is not up for debate. That I'm is not sure I've ever even had Fruity Pebbles. A, well, <laughs> don't do it. because it. But well, yeah, I'm just saying it's the best cereal of all time. And, and I threw an absolute fit. I yelled at someone. I threw a towel at someone else. I like walked out of the house, started walking down Venice boardwalk because this was in, in, in Santa Monica. And the assistant house manager had to run after me and get me. And he asked me a question that kind of, kind of piqued my interest. He said, what happened? He said, all we know is you walked into the, the kitchen. We all watched you open the pantry and then you just went berserk. Mm -hmm. So what happened? And that question, what happened really got me thinking, well, what did happen? because I couldn't have been more inspired to do this. I knew what to do. I wanted to do it. So why didn't I? Right. Why was it not a matter of intellect and will, right? Mm -hmm. Why could I not know what to do, want to do it, end of story? And that's when I discovered the, the work by Doug Lyle, which is the pleasure trap. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you, there's not a single body of work that was more influential in helping me reorganize my life at that point in my life than Doug Lyle's work. Because what I came to believe was that the reason why I wasn't able to choose oatmeal in that moment is because I was weak. That's what I thought. I, I, I just have no moral compass. I have no grit, no determination. But understanding the, the, the pleasure trap, understanding the biochemistry, the actual mechanisms that, that, that drive compulsion, I realized that that was the exact right response 
my psychology and biology should be having. That every instinct in me is going to be compelled to make decisions that it believes are in the best interests of my survival. But that that mechanism, that guidance system only works appropriately when the environment is appropriate. That if the environment is too shifted far uh, enough away from what is representative of our natural history and our natural behaviors, we can be fooled into believing so strongly from a motivational standpoint that we know what to do when in fact we're being self-destructive. So I told myself, Doug Lyle is essentially saying, Adam, you got to be comfortable being uncomfortable, bro. You got to decide what to do, understand that it's likely going to be pretty darn uncomfortable experience in the beginning. And that is that is the appropriate response. That is a good thing to happen. And just do it long enough until your dopamine pathways regain sensitivity. It doesn't feel so difficult anymore. And so a lot of people would say, well, then why did you do it? What's your motivation? What's your why? And everyone would look at me and say, well, that's pretty darn obvious. He's 350 pounds. He has diabetes and heart disease. And he nearly died from substance abuse. That has to be why he's doing it. And it's not. I don't believe there's a single person whose long-term behavior changes are motivated by negative consequences. Mm. What I think the greatest thing that negative consequences offer us is they let us know that there's something loving and meaningful and incredibly important that is being threatened. Mm. There's something in our life that means the most to us that is being threatened. And it's whatever those things are, those are your motivation. Love, in my opinion, love and meaning and connection are the greatest catalysts for long-term change. Sometimes it requires a negative consequence to recognize what those things are. Sometimes it requires unbelievable urgency to recognize that if I don't do this differently, that thing, those things that mean the world to me could be gone tomorrow. And I have the opportunity to protect them today if I wanted to. I still have that opportunity. And so I made those loving and meaningful bonds for myself, those were the reasons why I decided to do what I would do. It's that I think that if what you're looking at is how do I avoid something? Well, that may not be the best strategy. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do to avoid using drugs that aren't going to craft a life for you that feels like a safe, secure, and hopeful place to be. I wanted to know what was the appropriate thing to choose. Like, I don't believe anybody avoids something. Like I didn't choose to not sit for this call. I, I decided to stand, right? So I, I got up every single day. I prepared a meal on a plate that was a choice to be what a friend of mine, her name is Tara Kemp, um, become a loving caretaker of a body whose entire purpose for existence is to make sure you survive to tomorrow. Mm. The only reason why I survived my suicide attempt, the only reason why I survived... 10 years of unbelievable chemical and physical abuse is because my body never gave up on me. In fact, my body has been fighting for me since the day I was born. It's the greatest ally I will ever have in my life. Several people in my life, several experiences convinced me differently, but my body never stopped fighting for it for me. So if that's true, my goal isn't to restrict and abstain things from my body. It is to be, to be very clear about what my body needs in order to do what it's wanted to do its entire life, which is to create a sense of thriving in meaningful health. Well, that means I take on a caretaker role. My job is to care for a body who has a very specific purpose, which is to care for me so that I get up every single day and have life feel like an amazing place. And within six months, I reversed my diabetes, my heart disease, my erectile dysfunction. Within a year, I lost 150 pounds-ish. And... Um, I got off of all my psych meds, all my anxiety medications, ADHD medications, antidepressants, mood stabilizers. Um, I, I, I have 11 years of continuous recovery. Um, I don't like to say sobriety because yeah, sobriety is like saying you're vegan. It only tells you what you're not doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, I eat a plant-based diet that tells you exactly what I'm eating. I'm in recovery, which means I'm intentional about the things that keep me moving towards a life that is... It, gives me the sense that 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 being present is a safe thing to do that being present is an exciting thing to do that tomorrow is a safe secure and hopeful place to want to be a part of those are things that build resilience that build, build self-esteem why be resilient if tomorrow isn't worth it to you right right 
Uh, so, you know, now I've, I've had the good fortune of, of actually lecturing several times at events with, uh, with Dr. Lyle, which is just incredible for me. Um, and, you know, I, I really want to kind of change the narrative about addiction, uh, mm -hmm. because when you look at what people tell you is that gen addiction is a, is a something you're born with that, that there's some people are addicts and some people are, and that's just not true. It's not true because we see it play out. And when you understand the, the motivation behind using, you see that that is the exact right response. I say it like this. Addiction is not a disease as much as it is the appropriate psychological and biological response to a life that doesn't feel like a safe, secure, and hopeful place to be. Therefore, recovery cannot be in the singular pursuit of abstinence. It has to be in the appropriate and accurate reorganization of an individual's life so that their life becomes a place that they want to be a part of. If they do that, the use is no longer necessary. Man. I, I don't even know where to jump in here. I mean, that's so many gems of amazing wisdom. You're, you're touching on so many themes that have been for me, like I, I completely am with you with that difference between sobriety and recovery, the difference between addiction and dependency, the way that we think about you take one drink and you're instantly an alcoholic and it's, right. it's just going to be this sort of indiscriminate, you know, and you'll, you'll see this language used. It doesn't discriminate. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it was very comforting for me to kind of embrace that narrative for a while that, Hey, it's not, it's not my fault. I don't have to look at any of my stuff here. I just, you know, wrong, wrong place, wrong bar, wrong, wrong time. But I, I have had the experience, even though I have been sober for a little over 10 years now, that not all of that time has been active recovery. I, I use the phrase dry drunk, which is a big AA thing where you're abstaining from your drug of choice, but you're not making your life a safe, secure, hopeful place to exactly. be. You're not addressing the reasons that you were drinking in the first place. And, and sort of that, that clash between how to think about addiction to begin with, and then how to address it going forward. And, and you and I are both, you know, our, our rock bottoms were pretty rock bottom. Yours, yeah. yours more than mine. I, I was a blackout drinker, daily blackout drinker for about 10 years and, uh, you know, running, running away from life and all of my, my ways. But I think for people who are listening to this and just to broaden the conversation who kind of can't see themselves like, oh, well, I'm not nearly that bad. So I don't know how to relate to this story or how to think of my own addictive processes within this context. One of the questions that will come up sometimes is, well, your childhood wasn't that terrible, right? Like you, you had loving parents, you were in a pretty secure situation. You just had a couple of comments here and there, and we all had comments here and there and not everybody turns into this, you know, total yeah. gutter drunk that I was or, or a uh, criminal addict that you were. Um, and so surely there must be some sort of genetic component that makes some people more susceptible than others. And I, I always think of that, uh, that, that rejoinder as, you know, it's not everyone's addiction of choice. Not everybody is, is getting into drugs or alcohol in the same way that we did, but they're still living in addiction on so many levels and so many behaviors and so many yeah. interpersonal things. And they're still, they're, they're avoiding doing that work of making their life a safe, secure, hopeful place to be. So that's a, that's a really great point because you do hear that all the time from people that you just know in your life. They're like, well, I, you know, explain to me because, you know, I know lots of people that have had traumatic childhoods and yeah, they're, yeah, they're, way they're worse. okay. It's like, well, do you know that? Mm -hmm. Do you know that? Or do you witness what they show you? And then you make a story that says, well, that person's okay. Because believe me, one thing I know about myself when I was struggling with my, my substance use was that, oh, I could put on a show for people. People don't understand how yeah. much of your bandwidth is expended putting on the show for people. Putting on and a show. that was the most common thing I heard from people when I got sober is I didn't, I, you didn't seem that bad to me. You didn't, yeah. it didn't seem like you were that far gone. I'm like, well, because I was working full time and hiding it. That was, that oh. was my main job. I also like to point people to a study, which it's not the, the most robust study, but a lot of people know it. And then there's one to follow up that I think is, is important. And that's the marshmallow study done on children. Sure. Yeah. So yeah. delayed gratification. Child, yeah. This is to sort of try to, 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 to create a sense of who, who, who is more of the addictive personality and who, mm -hmm. who's more the dopamine seeking craving behavior pattern, who is the willful, I can wait till later behavior. But they take kids and they put them in room 
uh, one at a time and they, they give them a marshmallow and they say, here's a marshmallow. Now we're going to leave and we're going to come back in one hour. And if that marshmallow is still here, we're going to give you more. Mm-hmm. So if you're willing to wait, you, you're rewarded for it. And they come back and there's kids that waited, got theirs, and the kids that didn't, didn't. And there you go. Okay, there you go. These kids have dopamine seeking behavior and these, these kids don't. And they did a follow-up study to this that I think is really fascinating. Mm-hmm. This was done with crayons where they gave kids crayons and they said, hey, here's two crayons. And we're going to come back. And if you've waited and you haven't used them, we're going to give you an entire box of crayons. They come back and the ones that waited, they got the whole box of crayons, but then they took those kids. Uh, so the, the ones that waited, they gave half of them the crayons that they promised and the other half they didn't, mm. right? So half of the ones that waited were actually given the crayons. The other half that waited weren't. They took those kids and they ran the marshmallow study. Mm. What they discovered was the ones who were not given the crayons after they waited did not wait for the marshmallows. And someone would say, well, well hang on a second. I don't understand. Before they had, they would not be classified as dopamine seeking. And now I guess they would. That's interesting. I don't think it's interesting at all. I think what took place is a very appropriate psychological adaptation to a future that feels much more scarce and competitive than the moment before. Absolutely. Totally. Yeah. That but, kid's just running a new CV on the likelihood yeah. of, of exactly. well, does it make sense to wait around for the good stuff or should if I take now it now? you have to compete against distrust. How do you compete against distrust? You hold on to what you're given. You don't wait till later. Yeah. You take it now, you get your energy you can, you, and you take it and you leave. So for people to say that, you know, there's a genetic component, I mean, look, humans are built by genes. How could there not be a genetic component? But you cannot underestimate the influence of social and physical environmental factors on those genetics and on that psychology and its attempt to keep itself feeling safe, secure, and hopeful. Yeah. If you do that enough, if you test that psychology enough, it will adapt. And that adaption is not a flaw. That's an appropriate adaptation. Completely appropriate. Completely a beautiful adaptation. Yes. Um, I mean, I think when you were talking about your Captain America dad coming home yeah. from his run and and sort of you observing the self-loathing that he was expressing toward himself, um, yeah. like even the best intended parents do this. And that's equivalent to not getting those crayons. You're, you're yes. looking at him as the, your absolute role model and your hero, yeah. and it's not good enough. And good enough. so yeah. I'm, I'm never going to be good enough. And, and I'm already receiving external criticism that feels really bad. I've got plenty of internal criticism. I'm always amazed at how it always begins at 10. It's for everybody. It's always nine or 10 years old for me. It was as well. Um, that's when you're starting to become aware that, uh, exactly. there's, I've, there are things about me that are unacceptable and I got to figure out some strategies here of managing that situation. I think it's, it's just so important. No one's going to get it right. No one's yeah. ever going to get life right. 100% yeah. of the time. Um, but if I was to give advice to someone who's listening, um, there's a British journalist by the name of Johan Hari. Oh, I love his book. The, the Lost um, Connections. Lost Connections. Yeah. yeah. It's it's one of my favorite books mm-hmm. of all time. Mm-hmm. There's several things in there that I want to point out. First of all, um, he he kind of lays out a an ask for people. And he does this specifically in his TED talk about lost connections called um or uh, uh, his TED talk about his, his previous book called Chasing the Scream, which is the tag talk is called everything we know about addiction is wrong. Mm. And he says, um, and I know that this works because it's essentially what my parents did for me at the end. People who are struggling with substance use disorder, with anxiety, with depression, more than solutions to our problems, we want to be reminded that we've not been forgotten and given up on by the people who matter the most to us. Yeah. We need to be reminded that there is a place among them that is being saved for us. Mm. And the way that you do that is when you have the opportunity, you call that person who might be struggling and you say to them, I love you. I love you whether you're using or you're not. I love you whatever state you're in. And if you need me, I will sit with you because I don't want you to be alone or feel alone. You can follow that up by saying, I don't know how to solve this problem but I want to help you find someone who can, if you're interested. Mm. What this tells that person is that they are far more valuable than they believe. They Mm -hmm. are far more valuable. In in fact, they are a part of the goings on 
of that individual's life that makes their life meaningful for them. Mm -hmm. And that is such a powerful thing. I know that's uh, essentially something that my parents said when I called them and asked for help, because one thing that I didn't hear was, I told you so. Mm -hmm. Not once. Not once did they say, why did it take so long? How, why, you know, we've been noticing this forever. How, how could you not, you know, call us for, or what do you expect us to do? All they said was, we love you. Please come over and let's figure out how to do this together. That is such a, such a powerful way to remind someone of their significance in other people's lives. It's so important to recognize that we have a place within a community of shared respect that in fact, our presence in it makes that community of shared respect have a meaningful experience of being alive. And so if you in the, are in the position, and not everybody is, it's a, it's a very privileged thing to do. I was going to say, do. this is a very fortunate that you, you got that response to that phone no, call because but, but if, not if, everyone if has it. If you have the opportunity to do that for someone, I urge you to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, you know, I, I, I don't know if I'd be here today if I didn't get that response. You know, it's like we talked about before, the, the, the worry of showing yourself yeah. to that last lingering thread. Well, what if they reject it? What does yeah. that mean for me? What, what does my world look like now? Because it's as bleak as I can tolerate right now. And if that lingering thread is severed, why bother at all? Yeah. And so you, you remember, for those of you who are listening, if someone does reach out to you, they are, they are risking that lingering thread. And it is, a, it is an enormous feat that they are doing. It's an extraordinary, an extraordinary act of courage that they are doing and, and, and don't take it lightly. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I think it points to the tragedy of one of the many tragedies of addiction, um, especially when it gets to that level with a, with a physical dependency addiction like this that we're talking about where you're, it's stripping you of everyone in your life systematically and it's pushing everyone away and it is poisoning those relationships. And, and I think it does, probably for, for many people get to a point where they can't make that phone call or that phone call will not be received favorably, yeah. that there really is no one left. And of course, yeah. that's, that's the logic of 12 step and fellowship and finding a place where you can have that community and have those connections and see, see that you fit into some kind of tribal analog. Um, that is the thing I love are. most about AA. Yeah, me too. It's a room that is free for anyone who they can walk into that room and everyone there will believe them yeah. and say, not only do I believe what, what you're dealing with is painful, I felt it too. Yep. And I think that that's really important because what I want people to understand is if you're struggling with substance use disorder, if you're struggling with anxiety, if you're struggling with depression, you're not crazy. Your pain makes sense. You make sense. And that there are solutions to that. There's not one single thing that's going to be the solution to that, to to what what it is that's causing you to have these feelings. But I want you to stop. I want want people to stop feeling like their depression is an indication of failure Mm. or that their anxiety is an indication that something has gone wrong. Those those signals make complete sense. They're very appropriate. Uh, uh, Johan Hari says, what if depression is a form of grief for your life not being as it should? Mm. What if your depression is your psychology saying, I cannot be okay with my life as it is anymore. And so please feel this so strongly that you take notice. What if anxiety is your your psychology saying, tomorrow feels so unsafe, please be aware because I cannot go on like this much longer. This is too difficult to, to, to manage psychologically. Please be aware. What if they're your body's way of asking for help? Yeah. It's not the way we're, we're communicated, but uh, I go back to, um, to Doug Lyle's work because Doug Lyle and your work as well, uh, what, what you all uh, talk about is the importance of environment. Mm-hmm. That, um, when, I like to say this, um, uh, I gave a lecture and, and Doug walked up to me afterwards. He goes, you know, Adam, I've been working in this field for 20 plus years and I've been trying to find a way to say it right. You got up there and you said it in one sentence, and he's like, "I'm taking it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna quote you on it, but I'm taking it." I said, "Please do. If if you want to do well, you need to make your environment look like your goals." 
Yeah, he loves that line. Yeah, he, he cites you all the time on that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think that that's really important because if you can get very clear about the way you want your life to look, if you can get really accurate, if you can really dig in, mm -hmm. what, would, what would life look like in, if, my, if I was to wake up and have life feel like an exciting place to be present? What would it look mm -hmm. like? What would I be doing? Who would I be around? Then what you want to do is you want to make your physical environment calorically, physically look like that life. And then you're going to need to make your social environment look like it. You yeah. might have to change who you hang out with. You don't have to get rid of your friends, but you might have to change them because the people, might. That, they have to look enough like the life you want, or you're always going to feel like you're competing against behaviors that don't feel like the life you want. You're going to have to explain yourself too often. And that's never fun. It's, it's not just the life you don't want. It's the life that feels more comfortable. Yeah. So you don't want it, but you get drawn oh, back yeah. into it because it's nice and cozy and it's your old patterns and habits. And so that, I mean, that's the piece of control your environment that we, we never talk about is that it's, yeah. you know, sometimes we'll say blah, 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 social ecology, but let's like really dig into that because it's, yeah, it's, it is who you're surrounding yourself with in addition to what you have in your pantry. Um, mm -hmm. but it's also how you're conducting yourself. It's, it's, it's your relationship with your own vulnerability, with your own emotional yeah. honesty, with the truth itself. I mean, so much, one of the things that I came across very early in my recovery was that, you know, addiction is a disease of lying. It's, it's, you're lying to yourself. You're lying to everyone else. You, you are unable to live in impeccable truth with your word and your conduct. And the, the part of making that environment match the future that you want is I want to be a person who lives in truth and vulnerability all the time, because otherwise, how do you know who, how do I know who I am and how can you connect with someone who's not real? I love that you said that because uh, there is a quote by Jordan Peterson that I have written down and I probably read it to myself regularly. He says, if your life isn't as it should, try telling the truth. Oh, yeah. He, he's very he's very wise on all things truth. Yeah. yeah. And I just thought to myself, wow, boy, that yeah. really hits it right on the head, doesn't it? Because it, it's every central. day of my life as an addict was me convincing myself that this was still a way to go. No, I was aware. It's very difficult, you know, because look, you get it. You'll understand yeah. your life hurt. And then this thing came along and it solved that pain with ease and repeatability. I love repeatability. And more repeatable than anything you've ever experienced. And so you're unbelievably attracted to it. You grab a hold of it. You bond with it. It solves those things. And then one day you wake up and that solution is the worst problem you've ever faced. And you cannot wrap your head around how that took place. How in the world could the greatest solution become the worst problem I've ever faced. I've got to figure out how I can make this thing like it used to be. Yeah. Because yeah. you can't convince me it doesn't work. You don't know what my life felt like and you don't know how it feels when I use. So I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to get more. I'm going to figure out how to change the combination of things. I'm going to solve this thing. It it must still be a solution. It's like your psychology is so like grabbed so tightly to it that you have to convince yourself through lies that it's going to work. And you know, it's not. Yep. Yep. Yeah. The denial goes so deep and lasts for so long. And, you know, some people never get out of it. That's, yeah. that's the, that's what keeps you in it is that nothing else has ever fixed me. Nothing else has ever given me this feeling that this gave me early on. So, as you say, repeatedly, I, lo I love that because it, it was, it was so predictable. And for me, I mean, I don't, I don't think an alcoholic is made with their first drink. Um, I do think there's a kind of ramping up process, but my, the first time I got drunk definitely was a feeling of, oh, this is, this is the feeling I've been waiting for my whole life. Um, like and been given a, a giant hug by the universe. Yeah. It's it like, felt like a hug from the universe. It's like yeah. my life has been so hard. And then the universe gave this to me for dealing with my life. Thank you so much. What it felt like I could do was stand back from that constant management, that constant hypervigilance, hyper attention, hyper, like you were describing early on that, that attunement that you have to every single little piece of body language, every little inflection in someone's tone and everything. 
being drunk allowed me to step back from that. And that was such a relief because now I can just, I felt like I could just be myself. It felt like I was being true to myself when nothing exactly. could be further from the truth. And yeah, that, that resistance to giving up this thing that allows you to, to inhabit that space, even when it starts to destroy your life and the, the denial about that. And, and also the you know, well, if I don't have this, then I mean, I'm, uh, no one is going to even want to have a conversation with me and I'm not going to meet any competitive goals. And even if it's shitty, like, okay, I'll concede that it's shitty and it's not working anymore, but it would be far worse without it. So I've got to just continue to manage it and tap dance around it. And that's, you know, IE your life has become unmanageable. It is unmanageable. Once you've felt safety from a life that doesn't feel safe, it's hard not to grab a hold of it again. Yeah, you can't. You, you you are not going to allow yourself to do it until you hit rock bottom, whatever rock bottom is. That's why it is a gift. Yeah. yeah. So this is so this is why, like when I talked when we talked earlier, where I said I think that the pleasure trap gets fifty percent of the story one hundred percent right. Yeah, which is so great. Yeah. What I think is like, let's look at um let's look at the analogy that actually that Doug Lyle gives in his TED Talk, the pleasure trap, where he talks about the moths and the light. Mm -hmm. So he said, if you go outside and you leave your porch light on, what you're going to notice is that there are moths and they're, they're fluttering to the light and they're attracted to the light. And the reason for that is that they're, they're designed by nature to use the brightest lights in the sky, celestial objects for navigation. Mm -hmm. But when the brightest light in the sky is now your porch light, its internal guidance system is fooled, it's misguided, right. and it, it hits the light, it flutters down, hits it again and again and again, and eventually it dies. Yeah. Now, if you were outside and you were watching that take place, you might make a statement such as this. Why in the world would that moth do it? Do that? It must be crazy. Didn't mm. it just watch the other moth die? Doesn't it understand what's happening? Why this must be crazy? But what you have to understand from a subjective point of view, what's taking place is that, that by messing with the environment, by introducing a supernormal stimulus, a mm. stimulus that was never supposed to exist, that animal is now thinking and feeling like it's doing the exact right thing. When in fact it's self-destructive and it will always run the threat of repeating that destructive behavior that's true here's where i bring it a little one step further the reason why one person might every now and again go and check out that light it's going to be attractive it can't not be attractive there's no way around it you can go check it out but then it'll leave and go back and go do its other thing versus someone who's going to consistently grab a hold of it is how safe, secure, and hopeful their life feels. Mm. How many loving and meaningful bonds are still connected that give them something to want to show up and be present for without using that porch light. Mm. So for example, if you take my life as it is now, I'm very fortunate. My recovery was built on a platform of privilege and I completely accept that, that to be true. I have a family that welcomes me home they accepted me back into their life. They never let me go. They gave me a place. They gave me the opportunity to maintain those loving and meaningful bonds. I now have a loving and meaningful bond with myself, both physically and emotionally, that I want to show up and be present for every single day. My body is an exciting place to show up and be present. I have loving and meaningful bonds with people in my life that I want to show up and be present for every single day. I have a loving and meaningful bond with a purpose that I want to share within a community of shared respect, that I want to show up and be present for every single day, and have a loving and meaningful bond with a future that feels safe, hopeful, and makes sense, that I want to get up and work for every single day. Take that person that I just described to you with all those loving and meaningful bonds connected. You and I are having a conversation, and I drink a glass of water, and a person comes up to me and he says, hey, Adam, you don't know this. I put heroin in your drink. Hmm going to take place is I'm going to have an, ex an unbelievable euphoric experience of being high on heroin. That's going to happen. And I'm going to come out of it. He's going to walk up to me and he's going to say, hey, how was that? I'm going to say that felt great. And then he's going to ask me another question. Do you want more? Hmm. My likelihood of saying yes is unbelievably diminished because there are things in my life that are so important that that use will no longer allow me to be present for now, the more of those loving and meaningful bonds that are severed, the greater the likelihood of me saying yes, because it makes me able to tolerate a life I don't want to be a part of. In that case, addiction is not a disease. It's misguided self-care. Yeah. So for people who 
are you know they're 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 not alcoholics they're not mm -hmm. drug addicts yeah. um they have maybe a uh, compulsive relationship with food is is probably the most common thing um sure. or uh they drink a little too much on the weekends or they spend a little too much time doom scrolling TikTok or whatever it is you know people addictions are multi-splendored yeah. and take so many different forms this insight of you know, we, we have this phrase that Doug and I will use, which is work harder on your environment than you do on yourself. Yes. Um, and it's, a, it's a little bit like you're, what you're doing is you're reframing that, which is you're working on your environment more broadly than just what's in your kitchen. Yes. And you're doing it in the image of what you want yourself to be. And so you are working on yourself in the, in the, oh, in yes. the form of your environment. And I think that that applies even to people who are not necessarily incredibly far gone with some addictive process, but they're just not fully inhabiting their life. They're, they're letting whatever that addictive practice or set of practices is sort of close off parts of themselves and their ability to connect with other people. And so all of this, the, the sort of what you're describing as the essential work of recovery applies yeah. no matter how far down the track you are. Right. Yeah. You know, it, 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 let's say, let's say you're a person who says, oh gosh, you know, I just noticed that like, like my, I'm constantly being compelled to, to eat, you know, foods that are kind of hyper palatable. And, and as a result of that, I'm constantly trying to diet my way out of the, re the results of that decision, or I have a, an adversarial relationship with my, with food in my body. You know, I, mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I, I get up every single day and I try to out compete my body with restriction and with ex exertion. Or, you know, at the end of the day, I'm drinking wine and it's starting to bother me or I'm spending so much time on TikTok, doom scrolling, and it's starting to bother me. What you would want to do is you, you want to do something that's not easy to do. You want to sit down and you, and you want to ask yourself some very difficult questions. Like I mentioned, the P Peterson quote, if life is, isn't feeling as you think it should, try telling the truth. Try telling the truth. Okay. Well, what would a... Um, uh, an allyship relationship with food look like? Hmm. What would it look like if food was your ally? What would those foods look like? What would social media use look like if it was an ally for you? What would technology use look like if it was an ally for you? What would your evening routine look like if it was an ally for you? And what you're going to do is you're going to take incredible notes. You're going to write that down. It may not be right, but you're going to get a sense of which direction you want to go. And then you want to build that into your environment. And this isn't going to be solving it. This is the start of it. What you want to do is you want to be, you want to pay very close attention to how you respond to those changes. Mm. If those changes bother you. If those changes require what feels like um, resistance, if it feels like, oh, gosh, you know, I'd really like to do, go back to that, that other thing, then you probably made a very accurate replacement. Yeah. You've probably done the work. Now you have to live in it. And that's not easy to do. And what I tell people is stop trying to live in it for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Give yourself permission to experience what happens if you live there for 30 days. Live there for 30 days, run an experiment. What happens if I decide food can, all, I, the choices I make around food are a choice that an ally with my body would make. He would, they, that, that person would give me these foods. They would never give me these. Mm -hmm. What would happen? And if at the end, at the end of those 30 days, you're going to say, did what took place seem to create the changes I was hoping would happen on day one? Hmm. Doesn't mean you have to like it, but did it happen? And if it did, seems like you started moving in the right direction. You can start to continue to tinker and, and make course corrections as you move forward. But that's a really difficult thing to do. Everyone wants to have it solved tomorrow because what you'll know this was the hardest question I think for any addict to answer is when did it take place? Mm. When did your addiction get so bad? I don't fucking know. I woke up like this. Yeah. I woke up like this. That's, that's how it feels. And so you want the same feeling to happen when you change, you want to wake up feeling like I fixed it. Well, no, that's just not the way it works. Your, your journey into your, adversarial relationship with substance use was probably a multi-year travel yeah. it took you a while to get there and you probably made some very serious course corrections in order to get it right the same thing has got to happen to, to get out of it it's not an easy journey it's an extraordinary one but it's worth it even on the, the smallest of things even 
you know, social media scrolling at night, even a couple glasses of wine, you have an internal knowing that what you're doing aligns with your core values or not. Are you justifying its presence in your life? Because you don't ever have to justify something that fully aligns with your core values. There's no justification for something that is truly in alignment with who and what you are, your values and priorities. If someone says, why did you do that? And that behavior fully aligns with your own determined set of priorities and values, you don't have to justify it. You only have to justify something that you know doesn't align. Mm. So be aware of those things. Mm. And you might, something that does align might feel very uncomfortable. You don't have to justify it, but it is going to bring up some feelings that you have to have this humility mm. to be present with and yeah. to talk to people in your life about and to experience because you've been working yeah. so hard to contain them and to avoid them. And that's why the community part, the changing your social yeah. environment is so important. You, you got to be around other people who, when, the, when you witness what they do, they do those things. Right. Because yeah. if you do it in the presence of somebody who lives the life you were using, they're going to ask you to explain to them why you need, feel the need to do that. Right. And they're going to judge you for it. They're going to do the, the getting along without going along questions. Uh, yep. Well, what about this? Or, or, or what, this is not good enough for you anymore? All those things. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to not feel safe. So you can have those people in your life, your, your friends that you that you currently hang out with regularly, you can have them in your life, but you're going to need to spend less time with them and create a, a, a social environment that looks like your new life. So that when you're there, what you do is the goings on of that social environment. And it's right. encouraged because when you look around, that's all you see. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we need to end it here, but I am sure there are going to be a million questions and we'll have to drag you back for a follow-up conversation. I'll come back on anytime. Um, anytime. This is, this is just a, just amazing. It would just, we've just scratched the surface of this conversation. I feel like, because there's just so much here and, and so many intersecting themes. If people want to connect with you, how, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah. So I have a website, uh, adamsud.com. Uh, you can uh, find me on Instagram uh, at plant-based addict. Um, and uh, you, I, I do have a TikTok account, but it's, I got like five posts on there. Don't worry about that one. So uh, <laughs> yeah, my, my website, adamsud.com is the best way you can get in touch with me. You can email me through the website. You can even get a discovery call if you're interested in uh, having me uh, work with you as a, a life coach. Um, you can reach out there as well. And you can see other interviews that I've done on there. Um, uh, some of the most recent ones that I was really proud of was uh, the interview that I did with um, Simon Hill on The Proof, um, which mm. is a great interview as well. Well, cool. Hopefully people will reach out to you there and um, and we will we will definitely follow up on this and keep the conversation going. So Adam, Absolutely. thank you. Thank you so much for joining. And um, this was just awesome. So My pleasure. all right, have a great one.